Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the best-selling author of Brown is the New White, Steve Phillips. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here. This is my uh, first Bioneers conference, so I'm honored to be with you here. <clears throat> And I'm uh, particularly delighted to be able to introduce the keynote speaker, Vien Trung. Her bio and all of her accomplishments are online, and you can read that in the part of the program, so I won't spend time with that. But I want to tell you a little bit about why I love and admire Vien. We're living now, as we all know, in very perilous times. And it's not just that there's a madman running for president. More profoundly is that there are many people, millions of people who have voted for this madman to run for president, and many people do not like people who don't look like them, and they do also do not value our planet and our future. And this is not an aberration in terms of our country, and it's actually a logical outgrowth of U.S. history in a, the country that was actually taken from its original inhabitants, developed by sl uh, uh, slave labor, and the land was then raped and exploited for centuries. And yet, through all of that, we've moved towards a situation where we were able to elect, after many years and decades of struggle, a black man as president in a country which held black people in poverty. And so what we are seeing today in this election is a visceral backlash against the progress that has taken place in a real desire to roll back the progress of our country and prevent us from moving from what was one a, was a, once was an unapologetically white country where the definition of U.S. citizen was a free white person up to now we have a multiracial country. And so in this moment, we need leaders for this moment. And Vien Trong is just such a person. I've been blessed to be able to work with her and see her in the, a range of leadership capacities. In my life, I've had the opportunity to be able to interact with CEOs and top cor corporate executives, top civil rights leaders. And Vien is just the, such a person who has the talent and commitment, the vision, the courage, and the dedication of people in that regard. She's an extraordinarily visionary leader who has crafted one of the most revolutionary public policies, this polluter pays measure, which has moved close to a billion dollars from polluters into disadvantaged communities and could be a model for the entire country. <laughs> She's a courageous fighter a young immigrant woman of color standing up for her position and her views and her organization and rising up to a level of leadership in her organization. And she's extraordinarily committed. And she'll talk a little bit about her own journey. But she is what uh, Jesse Jackson once called a working person's person, coming out of the struggle so against poverty and inequality and injustice, being part of that and in touch with that, those people in those communities and then taking those sensibilities and those values to the highest precincts of power, to the White House, to the top levels of the country. And so it's, I salute you for honoring Vien last night, and I'm honored to be able to introduce her today. And I think all of us are blessed to be able to have Vien as a friend, as a colleague, and as a comrade. And it's my pleasure to introduce Vien Trump. <clears throat> Oaktown represents, love it. yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much to Steve, who is a mentor and a person I really admire and look up to. Um, Y'all may not know this, or maybe you do because he's a New York Times bestseller, but he's a pretty big deal. He's such a big deal that the president goes to his house for coffee. So we are blessed, literally, the president did go to his house for coffee. Um, so we were blessed to have him, and I'm so honored that he was here. Thank you. Oh, 
One of the things that I love about Bioneers and the magic that Nina and Kenny and Teo and Josh and the Bioneers team has created here is how much it brings us together with love and really to look at what are the best things that we can create for our country. And I'm really excited to dive into that today. And I want to do that by getting a little personal. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because, see, I'm the youngest of 11 kids. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's trauma. <laughs> and I'm a mom of three-year-old twin boys. Mm-hmm. So I haven't slept for a million years. Uh, and I've, I've not been able to finish a sentence or a thought for a long time at home. And so today, I'm so excited to be able to spend a few minutes with you uninterrupted. Um, <laughs> Let me first by telling you a little bit about who I really am. This is my family. It's my mom and dad in the middle, nine of our kids. There's one who isn't in the picture. I'm actually in the picture, but you can't see me. I'm in the belly. And my mom was nine months pregnant when she got on this rickety boat with her nine kids, me, my dad, and an 80-year-old grandma. And they had to row 500 miles to get from Vietnam to Macau. And these were some treacherous waters. In fact, many of her friends and families had died trying to get across. Luckily, they were rescued and intercepted to go to a refugee camp. That's where I was born. And we finally made our way to the United States where we got to Oregon. My family became farm workers. We picked strawberries and snow peas as migrant farm laborers on fields across the state of Oregon. We probably would have stayed there forever, except my grandma started getting dementia, and so we needed fa family members who can take care of her when my parents were at work. And so we moved to Oakland, California to, yeah. I am so townish, don't even get me started. Um, and so what we didn't realize was that was during the crack years in the 80s. And when they got here, it was kind of hard. It was kind of crazy. And as parents who didn't speak any English with 11 kids at the time, all they could do was find work in sweatshops. So it's what my parents did and what my older siblings did when they became of age and it's what I did when I got older. It's what my family did for 15 years until I got into college. And so when I did finally get to college, my family was ecstatic. I was the first one ever, ever to go to college. And, yeah. and for, for them, the definition of success was how far you can get out of Oakland, was how much money you can make. So I went to Berkeley because I was kind of successful. Um, and, what was weird is that Berkeley is right next to Oakland, but the experiences of the people who were in Berkeley at the school was so different from mine. They had never experienced drive-bys in their schools. They didn't even understand what it meant for me to have witnessed my first murder when I was eight years old. That I had a brother who was in prison and a nephew who had been murdered. They didn't understand any of these experiences. And the more that I realized that I was living in an abnormal system, the more I realized that it was unjust and how unjust it was and that it wasn't an accident. The fact that there were other kids in the school who lived and grew from similar experiences and the, the color of our communities looked the same, to me was a realization that there was systematic injustices. And I redefined my success. For me then, it wasn't to escape poverty, but the purpose of my education was to figure out how to end it. And, and I, I say that because I love Oakland. I love Oakland. Like the biggest compliment you can give me is you are so Oakland. <laughs> and, and Oakland, I, we had 200 languages in my schools. We, you can go anywhere and, and, and meet people who will love you unconditionally because they knew we grew up from similar experiences. There was a, such a tight network of people who, who held us together. And, and it's because of that love that I am here speaking with you today because I am a refugee. I am a daughter of sweatshop workers. I'm a mom trying to raise three-year-old kids in Oakland. And I'm 
here as a policy wonk and nerd who's been trying to figure out what are the best solutions that we can, we can have that really supports and loves the people who grow up in Oakland and places like Oakland. And the weird thing is that what I have learned in this work is that we as environmentalists have figured out one thing, that we operate as an ecosystem. And that what happens to the bees affects the plants and the trees and our air. But for some reason, there's a lot of places around the country that doesn't understand what happens in Oakland and what happens in East Palo Alto and what happens in the Mission District and what happens in Richmond also affects everybody else. And it's, it's something we can't ignore anymore because we're in danger. And it's not as obvious as bombs falling around us, but it's 350 parts per million is the dangerous upper levels of CO2. We're at 400. The air is so bad, 7 million people died globally last year from air pollution. It's so bad that people in the Gulf Coast are losing their lands underwater at a rate of a football field an hour. A football field of land going underwater in the Gulf Coast every hour, all day, all year, for years. And in eight to 10 years, their entire community is going to be lost. And that's not just in the Gulf Coast. The rate of which we're going, by the time we get to 2050, 200 climate refugees will have been displaced if we're not gonna change things. And the only way we're gonna change this is if we actually lead with the heart and with love and compassion and connectivity. And I, I learned this the hard way because, you know, when I was, when I was a lawyer, they used to tell me that the, the measure of your leadership, the measure of your success is your intellect, your critical thinking, your analysis. And what I learned came apart when I went to Flint. I heard about Flint when I was driving home on the 580 with my kids and my husband, listening to NPR like a good progressive, <laughs> and raising my kids on NPR. Uh, and Flint started the, the, the realization that what happened is 10,000 kids in Flint all got lead poisoned. There are 4,000 undocumented immigrants who live there and they cannot go to the hospital. There are, the cost of replacing the pipes in the homes costs more than the value of the homes themselves. And you can't even sell your house because it's, it's considered illegal to try to sell house, a home with contaminated lead pipes. And so if you don't pay your, your water bill though, you can have your kids taken away from you by Child Protective Services. So the insidiousness of this all, this whole thing became crazy to me. And I heard then that the government actually knew about this for years and they didn't do anything about it. And they actually lied on test results saying that the water was safe and so people, people kept drinking it. And people died from drinking that water. And for me, the Dr. King quote came back to me in this flash that said, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. And I had just felt like we had betrayed Flint. And I couldn't stand for that. I called some friends who live in Michigan and asked, how do we help? What can we do? We got connected to Flint organizers. And they said, people are already turning away from us. They're listening to pundits and they're listening to this crazy guy named Donald Trump running for president who keeps tweeting crazy stuff and they don't care about Flint anymore. So bring the cameras, bring the, bring the media, let us tell our story to the country. And so we didn't have much, but we had access to the media and we packed a bus. In 12 days, we convened 12, two press conferences. We brought some celebrities, some influential people who can draw the media. And together, we created two press conferences. And I committed to getting their stories out and I wanna share them with you today. Nakia Wakes, who you'll see in a minute, this is her at the press podium. She's a mother pregnant with twins at the time and previously. Uh, and I really identify with Nikia because, you know, moms with multiples, we're like a tribe, right? Like we suffer together. And it's, I remember how, how yes, there's some twins around here. Um, and 
I remember when I found out I had twins, I was terrified and so happy. It was just this profound experience. When she found out, she felt the same way. And so I felt with her the, the terror of when she lost her kids because of the lead water. And they didn't notify her that as pregnant women, they shouldn't drink the water. She got that notice after she had already lost her babies. And then I heard the story of Denitra, who is in the picture on the right-hand side. She had three-year-old, and I had three-year-old kids. She put her son in the bathtub, and just for a few minutes, he started screaming and yelling. She pulled him out, and his stomach had started blistering and cracking and bleeding. She rushed into the ICU, and he stopped breathing for 83 times. And so now, as a single mom, she, had, she takes four hours using bottles of water to heat up to give him a bath. And then we heard the story of Juani Olivares, the Latina here you see second to the left. She's a Flint organizer and resident. She's the kind of amazing person who know, like, if, when she's your friend, you know she will always show up with a pot of soup if you need it. She's that person. And she was delivering just mountains of bottled waters to the families in Flint who were undocumented because they were scared to go pick up the water themselves because of the authorities. They were actually spending their own money to buy it from Walmart. And so she tried to do the help by bringing it, them the water. And she had just come back when she was coming to this press conference. She had just come back from a family that had a kid that had 10 times the lead poisoning in her blood system. And she couldn't go to the hospital because they didn't have papers. And so they could only go to the clinic three times a year, and they had already used one of their visits. I want to show you what's happening in Flint here. We made a video to share with the country. Because I almost lost my life. I heard about six others that did lose their life. Nobody cares because this poor African American. The people of Flint were poisoned. The basic human right of clean water denied. For nearly two years, residents of Flint have been told their lives don't matter. People want clean, safe water. It's like you don't even count. The Flint water crisis is the worst environmental racism case we have ever seen. People in Flint were not respected as full human beings, that their lives did not fully matter. And it's just a travesty. The governor let them down, and now it would be a shame if the federal government let them down the same way. If ISIS, or jihadists, came up with a strategy to poison 10,000 American children, what would happen? Congress would act within 24 hours. This is an internal email within the EPA, but I'm not so sure Flint is the community we want to go out on a limb for. Of all the communities out there, Flint is the number one place that they should have been going out on a limb for. People who put dollars over the fundamental safety of the people do not belong in government, and you need to resign, Governor Snyder. Flint, a city surrounded by some of the largest freshwater lakes in the world, was now delivering tap water contaminated with lead. Flint's water has been poisoned with lead. Lead, 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 lead. lead. 62 contamination vents in five years, never seen chemicals in bathtubs like this, ever. People are still getting exposed because they're still not being protected by their state government. Some people still don't know there's a problem. When I came to, that's all I knew was that they told me it was Legionnaires. We didn't even, to me, my understanding was, I didn't know the water was messed up. We're still being served up poison water at the highest rates. We're still sick. We are not getting the help that we need. But everything that has happened has come through the force and change caused by citizens. When the federal funds are coming in, ideally local people get the jobs so that we're both addressing the issue of unemployment and making sure that the money is coming back to supporting the rebuild. Green for us here because we are in solidarity with residents here in Flint and we wanted to make sure that we're bringing national attention and really handing the microphone to Flint residents and letting them tell us what's really happening. Well, what has happened to our community has not broken us. It's brought us together. I'll continue to stand up and call for action from Governor Snyder and our elected officials. At the end of the day, they can look at us instead of saying, oh, those poor people, go, oh. Look at those poor people. They got poisoned and they stood up and they made a difference. Hopefully it'll build itself back up. And I'll be a part of it while it's building up. I'm building up too, because I'm never going to give up on Flint. Join with Flint Rising to call on Governor Snyder to fix Flint and make polluters pay.
We're still not giving up on Flint, and I encourage everybody here to look up Flint Rising and support them in any way you can. And so one of the biggest champions that came out of Flint are, is, are the guys from Oregon State Penitentiary. When they heard about what happened, they brought pass around a collection plate, collecting a dollar, two dollars, five dollars in donations. And together, they raised eight hundred dollars which may not sound like a lot to other folks, but the average person who's in, who's in prison in Oregon makes $49 a month. So they were donating five to 10% of their total incomes for people they had never met in Flint. And imagine what that would mean if we did the same thing. How many of us who saw what happened in Flint changed the channels? They didn't. They said, what can we do? And despite being in prison, one of the most inhospitable places, they said, we care. These are people that our society has paid to put in prison. That people have decided they were not fit for society and have decided to throw away. They were the ones that had more empathy than the governor of Michigan, who ostensibly was elected to protect the people. And so we came home and said, that's what we need more of. We need more people who care because what's happening in Flint is not an abnormality. It's not unique. It's happening in the Dakotas. It's happening in Appalachia. It's happening in East Palo Alto. It's happening in Oakland. And we have to make sure that when things like this breaks down, that it's not the families who are paying. It's not the people who have the least that are paying. It's the people who have the most that has to pay the polluters. And so we said, this is on. It is on, we're gonna bring it. And we're gonna make polluters pay, and we're gonna make sure that they're accountable to our communities. Who's with us? Yeah, it's on. When we made this call, we were so happy to see that people around the country rose to the challenge. They had signs. We had Rosario Dawson, Shaka Senghor, uh, Mark Ruffalo, Ed Begley Jr., Van Jones, and organizers and organizations across the globe who sent in their support on Instagram and Facebook and social media and Twitter. And together, they made it trend for hours and hours and hours. Here's the thing. California is already making polluters pay, very successfully. 450 entities in this, in this state are required to reduce their pollution or pay for it, right? Clean up or pay up. And a group of us, scrappy young people, came together and said, let's make sure that the money is actually invested in bridging inequality and actually creating the communities that we want to see. And together, we required that now 35% of this polluter pays fund goes into the poorest and most polluted census tracts in the state. These are the census tracts that we have marked with the highest levels of dropout rates, highest levels of infant mortality, proximity to freeways and highways, groundwater contamination, particulate matter, on and on. We mapped these census tracts and said these are the only census tracts eligible for this set-aside pot of money. And together, we have created the biggest fund in history for greening up low-income families and communities. <laughs> After it got passed, we asked people, what do you want the money to go to? Everything they asked for, we got funded at the highest levels that those programs can absorb. It went into free solar panels, thousands and thousands of free solar panels, <laughs> affordable housing. Oakland just got noticed, it got 50 million in affordable housing funds, clean transportation, free bus passes for seniors and students. We got uh, van pulls from migrant farm workers who didn't have a fixed bus line out in Fresno. We got so many programs funded at the maximum that it could because we listened to the community and what they wanted. And here's why it matters. Because it's not just solar panels. It's not just a bus pass. It's transforming lives. 
One woman who heard about this program is Maria Zavala. She lives in Fresno, California, worst air quality in the country. And when she heard about it, she, her husband had just died from cancer and she had a teenage son in and out of trouble. We got her the free solar panels and her electricity bill, which was $200 on, av on average a month because she had to crank up the heater in the, in the winters and the AC in the summers. Her electricity bill dropped from 200 on average a month to $1.50. And that $200 now goes to giving somebody a job, reinvesting into the local economies. The power plant now cranks out a little less dirty energy, and it's making lives better for all of us. And so I will say this, that what we have learned in California is that what it took for us to have political and environmental sustainability is for all of us to be in it together. And not just to wait for the eco-elites, but to look at how do we actually all build and listen to the community and just bridge that. What we have learned is that when we just leave it for the eco-elites to, to do the work as they did in Nevada, it wasn't successful. It actually created a backlash alliance between the polluters and the poor people in Nevada when they tried to do it without having the whole community engaged. Because polluters were aggressive and the, they were able to say, that these solar subsidies were not going to go to the communities most impacted, and that poor people would be left with the bills. And they created this backlash alliance, leaving the door and the vulnerability to it, the back, leaving the door open to this backlash alliance. And we have to be able to move from relying on just the eco-elites to moving to having all of us working together. Um, Because we are in it together. We're victims in this society that has prioritized profits over the planet. Pollution and poverty, they're a reflection of that broken political and economic system. They're a result of greedy corporations that wants to build oil pipelines through our sacred lands. They're a result of industries scorching the earth in search of raw materials. Companies literally blowing off our mountaintops in search of coal and then dumping the millions of sludge and toxic waste into the streams and valleys below the mining sites. We're seeing this in Appalachia, companies that are leaching the dirty chemicals like arsenic into drinking waters for people to drink. In pursuit of greater and greater profits, it's led to the devaluing of people and to communities. They're hiring workers as cheaply as possible, saddling workers with debts and pay so low that they have to rely on subsidies, even while the employers are getting these massive tax breaks. They're destroying our families and our communities and leaving us to hold the bag. Climate justice is about making sure we're righting those wrongs. Our work, our work is about making sure that this isn't a fight about CO2s or PPMs. It's about making sure that the massive investments that gets generated responds to the threat that we're really seeing, inequality and global ecological destruction. If we do it right, then we can actually make sure that the infrastructure spending, the polluter pays funds, that the private investments are also used to create a new economy. We can use the investment as a down payment to create a world that we want with good jobs, clean energy, opportunities for all. It's a chance for us to really prioritize people over profits, where people can get some dignified work, a world where our demographics don't define our destiny, where my zip code doesn't determine how long I get to live. It's about fighting for a future where our families are protected and where our humanity is expanded. It's about a fight for land and water and food sovereignty, for workers' rights and for women's rights and for human rights. As my sister Mia Yoshitani from APEN says, this climate justice fight is not just a fight for a new energy system, it's also a fight for a new economy, a new democracy, a new relationship to the planet and to each other. And this is our shot. This is our shot. And we need to rise up and seize it. 
because when we win this fight, and we will, we will win the world that we want, and the future is worth us fighting for. Thank you.